Thank you, Jesus. We bless your name, Lord. We exalt your name. We adore you for your faithfulness. We give God praise and I want to welcome you as you join us today. Uh, I want to welcome you because uh, this teaching is uh, going to impact several lives. So if you are joining us for the first time, we want to welcome you to Springboard Institute. Uh, we had a little bit of a delay in our uh, training this particular day. I may release the word yesterday about training and how impactful that training can be uh, in our lives and how we can actually help us as a tool so that we can carry out uh, some of the things we are assigned to do. So the first thing I want to ask you this particular day is uh, to join and also to, uh, if you have not shared this message before, share it. Uh, if you're part of our network, to God be the glory, part of our alumni body, uh, we're excited to see you. And I'm also a strong believer that what God has prepared for you today, you are going to receive it. It's going to be a very powerful one. And I'm trusting God that uh, he will transform you through this. We will be talking about our five uh, fold series. And uh, today uh, we are looking uh, carefully uh, into the office, uh, exploring the office of a teacher. So uh, let's pray. Father, we want to thank you this hour. Uh, we bless your name. Uh, we're excited for your truthful and, and way you have shown us uh, your, uh, your light. I take authority from you this hour and I bind the prince and power of the air. I show them every demonic gate and I declare in the name of Jesus that you, God, will have prevalence today and your glory will manifest and your name will be exalted. Father, release the impact of this word. Release the impact of this particular day and let your children receive grace that we can use to lift one another up. All glory given to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So we, um, like I said, we missed uh, our time today, but uh, God did not miss transmitting his message uh, to us. So I would like you to open up your mind and open up your spirit because God is going to showcase us several things today that will uh, change your life. Now, uh, we are dealing with the advanced um, certificate, all right, the biblical studies. Uh, we are moving into the certification part and what we want to do here is to showcase you some of the strength stitch that will be able to help the pastors, that will be able to help preachers, that will be able to help evangelists, that will be able to help the teachers, that will be able to also help those who are in the field, um, prophets. So we have a course, the part of our first part of the paper course is course 400. We are dealing with the uh, advanced course. So if you have not received our biblical studies one, I would suggest that after this training, um, you can make an inquiry, you can ask for it, and it will be delivered to you. So I give God praise today. So I, I want, before I go in and tap in into uh, the major thing, I want to be able to quickly give you a little bit of information, okay? Um, basically, this certificate course uh, is a practical training. As those of you know, uh, I, we want to be able to expand biblical uh, leadership principle so that you can effectively operate into this culture. And you, can, you may ask me, why don't we get this anywhere else? But this the way that God gave us the grace to do with this certification program is that for students, if you are in a way want to study uh, some more techniques, preparing for the certificate will be able to help you. Who are these targets? We are targeting um, a Christian school principals, also directors of a humanitarian emergency relief. We are also targeting uh, that chaplain. So if you know those who are chaplains or who are chaplains to be, you can send them this information. We're also targeting those who are also camp directors or outdoor ministries, okay? Mission directors, Christian counselors, and of course, all those who are in the five-fold ministry. Uh, we want to look into, uh, for example, what are the characteristics or traits Okay, uh, that can be in the path of an effective leader. What an effective leader is supposed to possess, and what specific behavior do an effective leader uh, exhibit, and what are also the activities that are appropriate for a leader. So these are the things that we'll be looking into as we go through this process. Now let's get back into this particular fourth part. We want to actually break down on this fivefold office gift. 
for the church. Like I said, the sports that we are doing have so many different series, but I want to actually target and focus on the fivefold and what it will do uh, in your life. So we are looking into the significance of the fivefold ministry in Christian leadership. We want to clearly state what the purpose of understanding ministry offices and gifts are. It is imperative for us to understand the purposes and the gift of the Spirit. We also want to understand fivefold offices. We want to break down the roles of a prophet, the roles of an evangelist, the roles of pastors, and the role of teachers. And also, while we are going, we will also discuss the unique gifts that are associated with each ministry offices. Now that I've spoken into this, you may want to ask me, where do you want to start? So when we are looking into the fivefold, I am being uh, uh, geared today to, to, to kind of target uh, a specific area, which I know uh, uniquely that will be part of what will bless us. Hallelujah. And I do know that uh, as long as, as the word of God is concerned, this unique part, this unique part will help us to exercise and expand the grace of God. If you are joining us by the grace of God, by Zoom, please, we will appreciate it if you can put your system on mute. Hallelujah. God bless you. Those who are joining us on, on Zoom, please put your systems on mute. And may the Lord bless you uh, as you join in. We are trusting God today because we want God to use this method uh, to facilitate uh, an incredible work so that we can expand in his work. If you all can hear me, smile and say amen. Hallelujah. And I also do know that as this training goes forward, it's going to enhance your understanding that will also uh, make you uh, make you outstanding. I'm trying to make some adjustments here, so please uh, bear with me. To God be the glory, bear with me as we work on this. And again, use the opportunity to invite your friends, uh, invite your relatives, invite all those who God is sending to you. Now, let's talk about the office uh, of a teacher. And I want to be able to move around because last time when I dealt with this topic, I dealt very clearly uh, with the office of the apostle. I dealt with the office uh, of the prophet. And I dealt with the office of the evangelist. Of course, the pastors, that one we know. But I also want to be able to get in there with the office uh, of a teacher. Now, when I mentioned the office of a teacher, there are many teachers who online and there are many teachers who God is using to be able to carry out his work. Amen. But it's also very, very imperative for those of you who are teachers to also know that your giftings can be used in multiple places. For example, God can give you an opportunity to have a major and a minor in your spiritual gift. All right. God can do that. So now the question now is that how do you apply uh, these giftings to make yourself very effective? Now, now, what are the things that you're supposed to do, all right? So I will be able to break these things down to be able to help us quickly. Now, let me jump right into this. And for those of you who want to write, you can be able to write, okay? So, and the Bible says in the book of Ephesians 4, 11 to 16, and he gave some, and I like that word, and he gave some as apostles and some prophets, and some evangelists, and some pastors, and some teachers. Hey, you're wondering, Apostle where am I starting from? The last on the list. It's the reason why. Okay, for the for, 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 for the equipping of the saints for the work of service. So the, the primary purpose is for the equipping. And equipping means that they are intentional where to be able to build up. So there are certain things that must be built up. Many many people like to plant churches, which is great, part of Spring World. But when we plant all these churches, we sometimes forget that it's a part of equipping the people. When we have alumni, they're supposed to be equipped for the work of service. It is a service. Just like you have the, uh, the Ministry of Education in some countries, the Ministry of Works, these things are all broken down. If you take the background, you will realize it is a work of service. The equipping of the saints, there must be an equipping. And then, and then to the building of the body of Christ. So that we are putting these things together so that we can build just like you build a house. As an architect, I can tell you, I'm an engineer, but I was first an architect. As an architect, I know that before you can be able to build a, a top house, you have to settle with the foundation. You gotta put the foundation straight. 
and depend on how deep you are going in the foundation, depend now will that will also be significantly important if you are going to put more buildings or put more layers in that particular area. So it is not wise, as we do know, to have a shallow foundation and then start putting multiple levels over houses. And that's why many houses collapse. Same thing in ministry. Many people want to drive. They want to drive so many big ministries. But in that, they don't have the foundation. They don't go inboard. Just like when we preach the word of God, many get excited. And after a while, some fade away. They are, we are struggling with the foundation. So what we want to do through some of these teachings is for you to understand what Ephesians 4, 11, 16 is talking about, that you must go deep. Can we all smile and say deep? You must go deep in that so that you can be able to build up. Hallelujah. You cannot build up and expand if you have not gone deep. So God wants his disciples to be equipped and to be enhanced so that they can be able to stand when trials and temptations are going to come. Now, let me say this over here. Trials and temptations are going to come. It's not just that there's a matter of when. And it says here, until we all attain the unity of the faith. So as a teacher, as a pastor, as a prophet, as an apostle, you consistently will be building, you consistently will be enhancing until the people of God, until the fivefold understand the full fullness or the freedom of what God have called them to be. Hallelujah. And now he says to a mature man. So our building, uh, our consistent training is until we see fullness of purpose. May I smile and say amen to that? It says fullness of purpose. So that means that you are not going to stop building until you've been able to fulfill the mandate of what God has sent you to be. Now, quickly here, and the knowledge of the Son of God. So as we are carrying out this entire fivefold, we want men and women to understand what God is all about. The strength, the height, the depth, okay? And the love of Jesus, the love of God that surpasses all understanding. So we are going to translate to the world because we've gotten this training. Now, lastly here, and then to the measure of the statute which belongs to the fullness of Christ. So we will keep translating this because all these giftings will be able to help us to understand how far we want to go. Now, let me get to the main menu here. Let's look at defining a teacher. First Corinthians 4, 15. Who is a teacher? Are you a teacher? Did God call you to be a teacher? Now, what is a teacher? A teacher as an instructor. Smile and say amen. A teacher is a coach. A teacher is a tutor. A teacher is a mentor. He is someone who influences others for good and for God. Smile and say amen. The passing directly influences. So if you're a teacher today, smile and say amen. You are a light giver. Can I say, can you say amen to that? You are a light giver. A teacher is a light giver. Your contribution, hallelujah, to the ministry of God is to make the truth and knowledge about God accessible to all. Can I say that one more time so that they can grasp it into your spirit? You are called by God to make the truth and knowledge about God accessible to all. So you are not just set for one church. You might start with one church, but you are set up to churches, hallelujah, to the body of Christ. You are not set up as a pastor. Although there is a connection which we will share because we want you to know how a pastor can also work with a teacher. All those are accessible things that we will also discuss as we go along with it. You have an anointing for breaking confusion and disinformation. Are you listening to me? You have the anointing to break off confusion and disinformation and misinformation. You are strategic in helping people know the truth of God and also how it applies to their own life. And that is the calling of a teacher. Remember, the teacher is a light giver. Can I say that one more time? Where the teacher is, there must be light. You have a unique gift in, and that is essential to the ministry of God. Now, let's talk about your test. Are you curious? For deeper understanding, learning, and revelation, I'm asking you if you say, God, I've called you to be a teacher. 
are you able to explain complex ideas and concepts in a way people understand? Are you the type that will search and research what you don't understand? Are you the type that will search and research what you don't know what you want to know? Are you interested in topics that other people find boring? Do you feel like you can see situations clearly and provide clear answers? I'm asking you, you say that God called you to be a teacher. Do you feel like you need that you never stop learning? Do you see the opportunity to share your perspective and your perspective excite you? Because if, you, if, you're, if the topic doesn't excite you, it will not excite anybody else. Do you feel frustrated when others don't have the same hunger to learn like you? Is that you today? Then I can say, amen, that you're going to share some deeper revelations that will help you. So I want to break down these things also for you because there are so many things or misconceptions that people say, oh, Apostle Didi, we don't need a teacher. I'll tell you, without a teacher in the church, these are going to happen. Now, listen and pay attention very well. Without a teacher in the church, lives are never challenged. If you don't have a teacher in any local assembly, lives that occurs in ministry will never be challenged. People's lives will never get embodied in the scripture. They are going to take the word of God and enjoy the way they want to. People don't understand why they should change if there's no teacher in the church. People are bored with the Bible if no teacher in the church. People are not curious and hungry to read the Bible if there are no teachers in the ministry. So what God want to also show us that, that there is a there are there is a vacuum of the teachers in many churches today. Because many churches hear the voice of the pastor, which is great. Because the shepherd. But after a while, if that pastor do not have a, a, a giftings in the house or his own calling also, I can say a major or minor, to be a teacher, then you have situations. So what is the vision for the teaching ministry as assigned by Elohim? What is the vision? And this cannot be accomplished. And so you have to ask yourself this question. How do we best accomplish spreading the truth of God? These are questions as your teacher, I want you to write down, I want you to underline. How do we best steer curiosity? I use the word steering curiosity and desire for the scriptures. Because like I said before, there's a part for foundation. How do we also help and apply the Bible in our lives? And how do we best make complex and confusing topics very clear? The Greek word teacher mean the Daskos. I mean, if you will really be asking me, Apostle Didi, your name is Didacus. Yes, Didacus uh, in Italian means maestro. Didacus actually means teacher. God called, it's a Greek word, all right, to teach. All right? Maestro is someone who is like a master or can call it a master teacher. It means instructor, all right? It means a doctor in the area of teaching, master or teacher. One who teaches the people the word of God and explains the scriptures to them in a digestible form. Can I smile and say amen? I say in a digestible form. All right? Teachers have the ability to bring forth revelation. You want to write that down, to bring forth revelation. Clarity and understanding from the word through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. So every one of the fivefold ministry person can teach as part of the functioning in their offices, just like a secular teachers do. Now, oh, they, again, you have Bible school professors, okay? But this does not make them a teacher as a specific gift given to the body of Christ. One can teach, all right? You have secular teachers. That doesn't mean they have the grace and anointing to teach as someone who God have assigned. So a true gift of teacher is one that has the anointing. Can you hear that word, amen? Anointing of the Holy Ghost or the Holy Spirit and the grace to bring understanding and establishment in the revelation and purpose of God through the word of God and the body of Christ. A gifted teacher 
in the ministry does not have the ability of grace to bring profound exposure to doctrines. I'm talking about a gifted teacher there. But they also possess function to bring maturity to the body of Christ. Now I want you to get this here. A teacher effectively communicates revelation and bring anointing understanding. There is a need for true mature teachers today. If you believe that, say amen. That will rise up within your context, rise up within your territory in the body of Christ. We all must bring to identify this ministry gift. It's our calling to identify where they are. So what is the spiritual gift of teaching? What is the spiritual gift of teaching? As many of you will ask me. Now, before I jump into that, I want to share quickly with you something that is, I would say, is the subtopic of this. But we are dealing with, for example, the area of how gifts are also operate. Okay? A spiritual gift or a characteristics of a motivational gift. Now, let me kind of break down here so I can give you clearly what motivational gift is all about. In the church of God, God wants people excited. So there are some motivational gifts they are given. So a Christian motivational gift, okay, represent what God does and what shapes his perspective on the life and motivates his word and actions. Romans 12, 3 through 8. Basic motivational gift. Characteristics by inheritance of qualities and abilities within a believer. The creator uniquely himself have workmanship in us. So there are some motivational gifts that God has placed in the body of Christ, and this is one of them. Hallelujah. God makes believers aware of the need that he wants to meet through them. His manifestation. 1 Corinthians 12, verse 4. These are the diversities of gifts. How God works in a believer is to shape his perspective in life and motivates his actions and functions. So when I'm talking about a motivational gift, things, this gift of teaching happens to be one of them. Each person's behavior will vary. We are dealing again with different people, factors such as the temperament. I'm talking about teachers now, right? Those who are getting giftings. Their background matter, their age matter, their gender matters, their culture matter, the circumstances around them matter. However, it's not unusual for individuals who share the same motivational gift to demonstrate common characteristics. Such as some general characteristics are typically exhibited in some of the motivational gifts of teaching. Let's look at some of those general characteristics. Smile and say amen. So again, I'm going to ask you to pause and share this message. Pause a second, share it, invite somebody. It's getting so good. It's getting so good. I'm excited about it. Let's look at some of the general characteristics. A teacher's basic motivational gear drive is to discover and validate truth. You want to write this down. The basic motivational drive, something that motivates a teacher. If you say God have called in the area, is to discover. I hear the word discover, okay? To discover and to validate. Because this is in something that is in, in, like internal. Teachers are very sensitive to doctrinal integrity. Give somebody high five where you are. Give somebody high five. Now you wonder where there are so many confusion in some churches about doctrinal issues because the giftings of the teachers are at times lacking in those churches. And that's why you got lies wrapping all the places in doctrinal, all right? So teachers are very sensitive to doctrinal integrity. They have great research skills. Smile, give somebody high five. Ask them, do you have some research skills? You will know the truth and the truth shall make you whole. The truth shall set you free. And they are very sincere. Christians also who have the gift of teachings, they search for the truth. They teach us, they study. I'm just giving some of the breakdown. They study diligently, all right? They sift through the scriptures as an archaeologist would carefully sift through artifacts from past civilizations. This is how the teachers go. They go through different, just one truth. There's one, there's one pastor, um, it's a close friend of mine. Um, he can take a very, very short topic. My goodness, very, just one line. Oh, he will go to encyclopedia. He will figure, he will, he will just go to libraries. Same word. He will break it down in such a way that the fifth grader will get it. 
a fourth grader, he will break it down. Whether you are on a higher mountain in understanding in life, whether you are a college professor, you will get it. A little kid will get it because he have in-depth grace. He will go in like, you know how an, an, an archaeologist is searching for the things of the past so that he can find th things to help. He will research the Old Testament. He will research the New Testament. He will go into books searching so he can explain it better. So office of a teacher. Do you have them around in your local assembly? Do you have them around in the alumni group? Where do you have them? Discover them and use them to expand God's work. So they also are hoping to find answers to numerous questions. A teacher goes in the point of discovery. So they go in with question marks to find. A teacher is not, a, a pastor will go in as a shepherd. This is what the Lord said to me. A teacher questions everything because it's a grace. And I know I've shared a little bit of in-depth thought about like, Apollos. Um, the Lord give the grace, we'll talk about that also. But I know that we have time in one of our teachings that we deal with um, not just specific gifts, with different uh, leadership formats and how they operate, leadership style. If you are not one that have received those leadership styles training, uh, please get it. It's very, very important. A teacher's passion is to discover and validate truth. How? They are commendable, but it must not also become a focus in the mission and then they will lose its balance and perspective and role. A teacher helps keep the church focused on truth. They are right to false doctrines and they do not honor the experience over the authority of scripture. Now, there are people that will say, well, apostle, they have 60 years experience doing this. A teacher will break it down from scriptural part. A teacher instantly, listen to this, instantly question anything that seems inaccurate. And also, unusually, unusually that doubt motivates him to search the answers needed. And I use this as a part to help because there's a point when I'll be teaching, they will ask some cross questions to throw confusion. I, I, will, I will look at methodology later. I'm not sure I'm going to be allowed to do that today. By the Spirit, I'm just going to focus on what the Holy Spirit wants me to talk about today. I will look at methodology. Yes, somebody asks questions What when you are in the Bible study format and people throw questions left and right, I usually ask people to write the questions down to avoid confusion and, and also tribulation because sometimes some topics go so deep and people want to stop you so they can create diversion. Thank you, Holy Spirit. I'm answering that question already. So you stop, but you let them write it down. If they cannot write it down, you write it down yourself and you say you get back to it because you don't want the devil to throw you off as a teacher, because that's what the devil does. He put those things there to make you to be off track, so you will lose what you are trying to explain. There are some that were dealing with the issues. For example, when I was when I was talking about the topic um, about the the doctrine um, of marriage, scripturally speaking, and then those who don't like that when talk about one man and one wife, we kind of throw in and bring in some confusion in the midst. So usually I would also like to write it down and then I'll get to that topic later. When you deal with homosexuality um, in the church today, I'm dealing with, with teachers now, right? Um, they have issues that some ministers are, are ordaining for some reason, I don't even know. Uh, they say that they are allowed uh, to ordain people who they know that scripture says, these are the things that God himself cannot deal with. And they say, well, it doesn't matter. Possibly. That's where you have a lot of inaccuracies. There are many big churches today who lack teachers. Many large churches. Why? Because they don't have anybody to stand and speak the truth and law. Okay? They don't have anyone to be bold. Now, apostles got their own function. Somebody asked me, what about apostles? Apostles got their own function, which we talk about. Uh, but uh, teachers also have their grace and giftings that they must reveal. Uh, yes, if you have questions, uh, if, you, if, you are on the, uh, if you're on Facebook or you are on uh, on Zoom, you can write your questions down. But teachers got unique way that they can listen to what God is saying and they can be able to say, well, this one can hold and now go into research. I have a habit. When something is basically troubling somebody in the midst of where I'm teaching, I pack, stop, take the question down and say, I'll get back to you. Now, I'm going to stop here and listen, listen carefully. I'll get back to you doesn't mean that you are evading not responding to their answers. God is not a God of confusion. It's the Lord that will reveal to you that there's something that you need to go in that more. I made it a, a short video yesterday about training. People think it's not a joke. You need to be humble to listen to somebody 
who the Lord have given a gift and to teach you. All right, I don't want to deviate. Now, a teacher in instantly, inst by instinct, question anything that seems inaccurate and usually doubt motivates him to search for answers. Now, let's talk about the strength. Smile and give somebody a high five where you are. Hallelujah. Smile and say amen. Tell somebody about to get some big stuff now. Let's talk about a, a, a teacher's strength. I know many of you want to hear that. Okay? By experience so far, um, by, by the grace of God, um, there are things, few things I've learned. All right? A teacher carries out research, uh, okay, by search, and gain information and insight. He views Bible study primarily as an academic <laughs> an academic activity with a spiritual benefit rather than a spiritual activity with a, an academic benefit. Did you, did, you, did you get that part? Did you get that part? If you don't get it, let me say it one more time, all right? A teacher views the Bible study. How many of you have teachers doing Bible study in your local churches? Don't lie. You can write that down. How many of you have teachers, actual teachers, okay, leading Bible study in your local assembly, Okay. Now, there are some churches that the pastor does everything. Now, if the pastor is gifted, like I said before, it's okay. But sometimes you pastors preach, which is great, all right? They are called in to teach fine. But if you have someone who God have equipped in that place, the first thing you must know is that they will look at the Bible study primarily as an academic activity and with a spiritual benefit rather than a spiritual activity with an academic benefit. That means they come in ready to go. They come in with revelations. They come in giving you uh, the synonyms of, I mean, they're like, they're like, oh, they go deep. He or she is passionate about correcting errors. Did you hear me? Correcting errors before it leads to apostasy. And this is why you need a teacher in every church. A teacher, these are their strength, receives special delight in uncovering fact or insight other than having either overlooked or considered insignificant. A teacher places great idea or deal of emphasizing on original language. Did you hear what I just said? Kenneth Hagin, one of the greatest teachers and one of the greatest prophets. Oh my goodness. He will go in, he will start going into the Aramaic version of the Bible. And he starts saying, like when, when one of his teachings that I listened to when I was young, when I was 22 or 21, I was less than that. On um on the on the word in Mark eleven twenty two, and he went is winning and deep and deep and deep and deep, and then he says, "I want to say to you what the original version said. It says half God's type of faith, and I, and I was shaking. And some versions, the new version says have faith in God. It says half God's type of faith. I was shaking myself. I said, what does that mean? Oh, well, God's type of faith is, for example, let there be light. And that was like, so there's a faith that is God's type of faith. And there's a faith you have in your child returning back home from, you know, from work or whatever. Okay. So that stones my heart and my mind. And I was shaking. I began to see the Bible in a different way. I began to say, I need to go deeper. I need to find out more facts about it. But that's only if God has given you that grace in that office of a teacher. All right? It's not something you pretend about. A teacher places a great deal of emphasis, and then the original words that were used and their meanings. All right? Usually an individual with this motivational gift is not hesitant to challenge statements, all right, made or ideas presently uh, presented by other teachers. Yes, you can challenge other teachers respectfully based on the word of God. An example, because the Bible talk about Proverbs 27, 17, about iron sharpening iron is a positive outcome of a teacher's passion for verifying information. So teachers have excellent, excellent study habits. Can I say one time? Teachers, if God call you there, they have excellent study habits, including investigations into different documents, okay? They are usually neither sloppy nor slothful when it comes to research. So no teacher has seen that God has called a slap when it comes down to the in there. Teacher's passion is to prove the fact that they are either true or false. And usually they receive far more satisfaction with the research and it does from presenting and what he have discovered in the research. Now, I was looking into Ezra, all right? Many of you know about Ezra, right? 
Um, I think I did a teaching at Ezra a few years ago. It was phenomenal. If I find that teaching, I'll put it, uh, I'll, I'll let people have it. It's the, because Ezra um, is a researcher. Um, Ezra, uh, yeah, uh, we do know that Nehemiah have done all his work, but you need an Ezra. Somebody smile and say amen. Say, I need an Ezra in the congregation. I need an Ezra at home. I need an Ezra even in my business. You need an Ezra. Everybody need an Ezra. You need an Ezra. Ezra is somebody that will buy you. Oh my God. Go in there. Discover the truth. Discover lost documents. Put things together. I believe that the teaching gifts that we have ignored have not helped the church to grow because I believe that there are so many things that the churches need to put back together to make the church grow. Teachers are known for faithfully studying the word of God because researching truth is a source of great joy for them. Unlike many of the other rest of us who must work hard and set aside time to study the Bible, the teacher often has to work hard, okay, to quit studying. Uh, okay, long enough to carry out all the necessary life. For example, for example, many uh, many believers with a motivational gift would such as again uh, uh, research a topic than do the laundry. All right, a teacher solves problems by studying more. Can you write this down somewhere? A teacher solves problems by studying more. The Bible would put it clear, like you know, you need like two or three evidences. I, I was in a meeting where this teacher was so bold. I even thought it was out of place because of the way he was speaking. And I feel like, well, he's not respecting other people. But he was speaking because his passion was there. He said, I guess, see, he's like, I'm going to give you more references. I was like, jeez, this one, boy, this one, this one, this one, this one, this one's crazy. No, he's not crazy. He's operating on a higher level of anointing. And he began to quote scriptures. He said, I'm going to give you this reference in the Old Testament. I will give you the New Testament. I will give you this. I'm letting you know that based on the scriptures, I cannot accept this doctrine because it's not of God. He shook the entire place and shook the entire congregation. The pastor is like, yeah, you need teachers. Everybody need one in the church. They prove it. All right? They study more. A person with the gift of teaching, number one, is diligent, is steadfast, and is sincere. Can you write that down somewhere? He's diligent, he's steadfast, and he's sincere. So if we have more teachers in our churches, they will, thank you, Holy Ghost. Let me give you an example, a teacher who is teaching about prosperity. A teacher, giving, it's not going to just take it from one end. He will take it from scriptures. He will take it from references. He will take it from, uh, from commentaries. He will bring it in such a way that he will get it. And he will push the ministry forward based on the knowledge and in-depth revelation of what God is saying. God want to help a church grow faster? He bring teachers. I'm going to just leave it there. You go figure out the rest. Now let's talk about the teacher's weaknesses. You want to write this down somewhere? A teacher may be tempted to equate or confuse knowledge with wisdom. All right? It's a weakness. Knowledge is information. Wisdom is seeing life from God's perspective. The two are different equivalent, not what of the same esteem. A teacher also tends to be exclusive. I'm giving you some of the weaknesses now, right? Preferring to limit their interaction and support to individuals or groups who share their doctrinal beliefs. And that's also some of the areas that some people have been stuck as teachers. They have not expanded the vision, nor moved to the next level that God have called them. Their concentration on facts rather than people sometimes makes them appear to be cold or insensitive. It's that you, that people run away from you because they think you are cold, because they think you are insensitive. Some of the weaknesses I'm talking about now. Teachers can also harbor disdain towards instructors who use illustrations to get attention rather than to illustrate them in a meaningful, memorable manner. Are you following me? They are also easily, again, uh, easily, uh, they also easily reject uh, unbiblical illustrations, condemning them as irrelevant and distracting. A teacher also, more than most of us, can also be tempted to be content with having accurate knowledge and be unintended having the next step, application of his knowledge. And so, because the teacher is able to, to, to accumulate knowledge, I'm talking about weaknesses now, okay? Because they can easily accumulate knowledge skillfully and apparently with ease, 
he or she can easily be tempted to be prideful. Are you following me? And have a, a condescending attitude, all right, towards others who do not demonstrate these gifts. These are some of the flaws that could be found in some of the people who are going to call in the office of a teacher. So these are the areas we consider watch out areas, watch out areas because the enemies can easily uh, operate in a hidden way. All right. A teacher also quest for truth, which motivates him or her to constantly question, uh, seems to be like everything else. Uh, okay. Often earn him the reputation of being a critical negative person. So somebody can see a teacher as a critical, as a negative person. Now it's very, very easy to happen. Teachers are often impractical, analytical, and unemotional. Are you following me? They tend to not be very interested in social activities and consequently may be regarded as a snobbish or selfish person. Enthusiasm is seldom a strength of person with this gift. Teachers also have a tendency to uh, 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 to give you more information than you ask for. <laughs> as a teacher right there. They easily be boring since their hearers are not nearly as interested and as detailed as they are. So are you a teacher? That's the question I'm asking you. Are you a teacher? What made you feel like you're a teacher? So in today's world, I believe that we need those who are seasoned and mature teachers in ministry that will be able to teach and impact the deep knowledge of the wisdom of God. So I, I want to say this to you. Well, this is not the era of, of, uh, of what I call the tickling the ear and uh, uh, the emotions of the flesh. That time is over. This is a season that God is calling for people to move away from their superficial entertainment and come to God and let the church be built. Acts 15, I'm going to give you some emphasis here. Acts 15, verse 35. Paul uh, also and Barnabas continued in Antioch, uh, teaching and preaching the word of God and many others also. Oh, hallelujah. So Paul was uh, an apostle, as we all know, and, uh, and uh, Barnabas uh, was a prophet. Okay? Yet both of them have the ministry uh, gift, had the ability to teach and preach. I, I hope you're following me here. Uh, so you can have two people uh, who are in two different offices, but they have the ability to teach. I talk about the major and the minor, all right? Preaching, uh, as we call the eugerelizo uh, in, uh, in, uh, in, uh, in the Greek word, it uh, means announce good news or evangelize. See, the fivefold ministry gift must be able to uh, teach and preach the whole gospel uh, of the kingdom resulting in an unadulterated and unmixed gospel of Jesus. And that would impact the church and empower in others, also empowering others and all the nations. I want to share with you some of the things that you need to know, okay? So God is restoring the fivefold. We all know that, right? Because they are the channel of revelation and purpose that God will have in establishing the order in the church. The fivefold gift also have the purpose of the commission in the Ephesians 4, we talked about that. But let me give you some of the uh, circumvent pitfalls, some of the pitfalls that you can find, okay? The word clearly said, do not permit those who seek to rule over God's house, okay? By virtue, I want to share that with you, our political or social authority, we have this a lot. Our political authority and influence in the area of business world is not criteria in the leadership of the church. Leaders should not be commissioned or set in position. Again, as a pastor, give me some summary here, all right? The teacher is the apostle, is the, pre the preacher. They step in there and they do mayhem in the kingdom of God. Now, I'm going to ask you one more question. All right? Our technology is giving me some challenges here. Are you called in the office of the teacher? Are you set up in the office of the teacher? Acts 13, verse 1. And now the church in Antioch, there were prophets and teachers. They are prophets and teachers. All right? 2 Timothy 1, 11. And this gospel, Paul said, was appointed and herald, a preacher, an apostle, and a teacher. So Apostle Paul is not only a preacher, he's also a teacher. So you can have people who have multiple gifts, a specific area, okay? 
I, I have a pastor who I'm, I'm trying to use that as an example, but I'm going to hold it up. Ephesians 4, 8. Okay. I want you to read this as you go. All right. He gave this gift. These are commonly what you have chosen to operate. But now, how do you have a pastor work with a teacher? By the nature and by the ministry of a teacher, he inspires. Okay. I call them truth aggressors. Okay. They operate by bringing the truth in place so that people will know they are called. James 3 1 says, not many of you should become teachers, my fellow, my fellow believers, because you know that he who teaches will be judged more strictly. So the office of the teacher is not something to be taken lightly. Are you listening to me? Presumptively, James point out that teachers will come out under stricter judgment. So as a teacher myself, let me show you how it will happen. If I myself believe a back doctrine, it will be a negative influence in my whole life, my own life. But if I teach bad doctrine, I have spread the corrupted influence beyond myself to others. Thus, I am incurring for myself a stricter judgment from the Lord. So to present the future Bible teachers, I say this to you, do not take lightly the sacred trust of instructing people in the holy word of God. First Corinthians chapter 12, verse 28 and 29. And God are placed in this church. First apostles, second prophets, third teachers. Their miracles, the gifts, okay? Now, watch this, watch this. For the helping of the guidance and the different kind of gifts, these are all gifts. It is God who chooses Bible teachers, write that down somewhere, and place them in his church. His church, not your church. So as a new believer, okay, when I'm 40 years ago, I thought to myself, I was called to be an evangelist. But also, God has also, in other things, his plans for me, right? And he also came and made it clear to me that he had called me in the Bible teaching ministry. So realistically, all believers, you want to write this down, all believers can and encourage to share scripture with others. I want to make that clear so you don't think, Apostle Didi, the only people who can go and evangelize or who can go out there, no, 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 no. God has called everybody to expand the world, okay? Realistically, to share scripture. Some can do it quite effectively, but just as winning a soul doesn't make a person on Ephesians 4.11 an evangelist, likewise, being able to teach reasonably well doesn't make one an Ephesians 11 teacher. So as an apostle, Paul asks, critically, are all teachers? The answer is no. The God called teachers, place them by him in the church as a special and unique grace for them to operate. Romans 12, 6, 8, we have different giftings. If God had called you to prophesy, you prophesy. If God had called you to teach, then... Hallelujah, the devil is nothing else but lying. <laughs> Hallelujah, the devil is nothing else but lying. God bless you. Again, I know this topic is so important. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I know this topic is very important. The devil will keep lying. 
that we are moving on the truth. Smile and say amen. Just when I'm about to share about the authority. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Hallelujah. So I want I would like you to pay attention to some of this last part here. Uh, we want to talk about the authority. Hallelujah. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Hallelujah. So we talk about authority, the authority of a teacher. A teacher's a teacher anointed, is anointed by God to teach his word, okay, does so with an obvious authority. Smile and say amen. Israel's teachers of the law during Christ's time on earth lacked that. But God called a spirit anointed teacher like you in a different way. All right? He must minister a teacher with grace and the giftedness, okay, that God has called. Okay, Acts 18, 11, Acts 19, 9 through 10. So Paul stayed in Corinth for a year and a half. <laughs> teachers, are you listening to me? Paul stayed for a year and a half teaching them the word of God. And Paul entered the synagogue and spoke boldly there for three months, arguing, arguing persuasively, a teaching gift about the kingdom of God. But some of them became obstinate. They refused to believe and publicly maligned the way. So Paul left them and he took the disciples, okay, and the discussions daily in the lecture hall of Tyrannus. So many of you are in Springwall Institute. Do you see the background knowledge now? He opened up his own seminary, okay? This went on for how many years? Two years. Those of you who want to do, who want to become apostles and they want to all do it in one shot. Some of you want to do that in six months or three months. Do you see how long it took them? Two years. And all of them, the Jews and Greeks who live in the province of Asia, have the word of God. Do you see how somebody operates in a teaching gift? They took time. This is the school of ministry that Paul was able to establish in tournaments for two years. And if you look at it, historically speaking, it's those people that Paul trained that took over the entire Asia. At times, God will stop something and want you to train other people like we do have now. There are alumni who are doing great work. Because God has instructed us to be able to enhance that word. So these are the authority that God has given to teachers, if you understand the authority. So the teaching ministry is systematic and for a long haul. Can you write that down? The teaching gift is systematic and it's for a long haul. Paul taught, again, the Corinthians for 18 months before moving on to another town. Hello, are we still here? So those of you who are, are called fly-by-night teachers, that have no patience, just want to run out, and you are an evangelist. You are not a teacher. Teacher stays in town. They want to equip. They want to enhance. They are not interested on something that makes them feel good. In Ephesians, Paul spoke for three months in a synagogue. Oh, my God. Consistency is a character of a teacher, right? You see that over here. And with mixed result, then he relocated the disciples and conducted a daily Bible school for two years in the lecture hall of Trinanos. Daily. Now, if we ask people to come into uh, even the teaching for once a week, there are problems. They find excuses. We ask them to come, they just find one reason or the other. Apostle today, I'm busy, I'm doing this. And you go there, they are really doing nothing. Okay? So I was once in an exclusive Bible story in the New Testament. The all forms. The word preach and teach have an exception. Why am I actually explaining to you this? Mark 6, 34. When Jesus went out shore, he saw a large crowd and he felt compassion for them because they were like sheep without a shepherd. And he began to teach them many things. Teaching in that. Like remember what I say, a teacher brings light. Okay? Shines light. Teaching ministry cannot be allowed to become detached and purely academic. No, by contrast, Jesus' teaching ministry proceeded out of his shepherdly heart and his compassion for people. He paraphrases that here, minister friend of mine, okay, let me paraphrase it here, struck in God's word, need to have a God small sheep for us, okay? What I'm trying to say to you here is the same thing in the book of Acts 13, 1 to 3, why they are doing it and how the fasting. Now, let me bring it to a closure here because of time, because I have more teachings that will be coming in this area. But I will get to this part done so that we can be able to have more time to break into this. Because I want to deal with the characteristics or the character 
of a teacher. I'm not sure if I have that time today. Okay? And I believe the Lord giving us grace will also share about the character. John 3, 2. Okay? Came Jesus out at night. Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher who has come from God. So I want you to pay attention to whatever you can find a teaching giftings in the New Testament. Whatever you can find it in the Old Testament, get that together as part of your assignment if you're a student of mine, right? 2 Timothy 1, 13, 2 and 2. What you heard from me, Paul, say, keep and also at the same pattern, sounds teaching with faith and love in Jesus Christ and the things you have heard me say in the presence of many witnesses and trust the reliable people, you also will, will also have to be qualified to teach others. So we are mandated to be able to expand the teaching gift or the teaching grace. A good Bible teacher will impact truth. Smile and say amen. Say, is that me? It will impact truth in such a way that he hears or has hearers will receive it biblically sound in truth. We keep it rather than bouncing endlessly in the air with doctrinal positions. And there is a multi, multi placed part when it comes down to the giftings. Paul releases it to Timothy and he says to the testimony reliable to people and yet others to come. Titus 2, verse 7 through 8. In everything, set them in an example by doing what is good. In your teaching, show integrity, my God. In your teaching, show integrity, show seriousness, and show soundness of speech that cannot be condemned. So teachers, please, this is the authority area. In your teaching, in your grace, show sound integrity seriousness found in speech that cannot be condemned so that those who oppose you may be ashamed because they have nothing bad to say about us oh my god so you are called to teach with integrity you are called to teach with seriousness and you are called to teach with soundness of speech you see i always tell folks that the pulpit is a sacred place all right it's not a place to share all the jokes in the world and funny stories all right we have heard in places. I know that from time people say, well, I want to warm up the listeners. Well, be careful what you do. Okay? That's irrelevant humor as we do know. Uh, but remember, we are sharing the word of God Almighty, and we got to know that, that those that are hearing us are sent by God. Second Peter 2, 1 through 3 and 8. But there is also false prophet and among you, and there also will be false teachers among you. They secretly introduce themselves with heresies. Even denying the sovereign Lord who brought them, bringing swift destructions themselves. Many will follow their depraved conduct and will also bring again the, down the way of truth to destruct. So I want to say this to you before I kind of uh, conclude this part today to God be the glory, that we are moving into the phase where a lot of false information out there. God giving you the grace to join us next time. We'll be looking into the, the, the character of a teacher. We share that a little bit today, okay? But I also want to get more in-depth information for you as a teacher. And I pray that the Lord will give us the grace and will give us the opportunity to continue to move on to the next level. Before I leave, I want to give you some of the assignments, those of you uh, who are students or those of you who are operating alumni. There are certain things that I believe that they will be helpful for you to use because this information will be able to impact knowledge in you so you will know how to drive the things of God I've given to you. And I know that many of you may have some questions, all right? If you have any question, I think it will be time for you to open up some of those questions and let's share what God is explaining or what God is exposing uh, for you uh, to do when you come down to the office, the office of a teacher. I am a strong believer, all right, all right, that God have called you. So you have to also to look at the impact that the teaching gift is making in your community, the impact the teaching gift is making in your place, in your home, in your family, in your marriage. And I believe that the assignment is there. Those of you who already have access to, to Canvas, if you don't have access to Canvas, please, you can send me an inbox from Facebook. Um, we can be able to send you a link to that. That will help you. Those of you on Zoom, so please make sure that you take this information. I will put that information again uh, for those of you uh, in, like in Canvas. I'll put that information again in Zoom. So for, the, for those of you who by any chance have not gotten that information, somebody is writing something here. Let me see. I'm going to put it for you again, post it here. 
So you can also take that information and try to find a way to get in there. Hallelujah. God bless you, Apostle Victor. You are all the way uh, in the uh, in, uh, the, in uh, the ones that are Tanzania, with the Lord strengthening you there. Um, I know we have some folks here also. Um, I know I saw Reverend Nancy here today. God bless you all. Uh, may the Lord strengthen you. May the Lord continue to expand what you're doing to all his glory. And I'm, I'm trusting God that this teaching will help you. It will also help the ministry and it help those who are hearing you. You can be able to share this. We'll continue to do this teaching as the Lord giving us grace until we have completed uh, this section of uh, of, uh, of the uh, 400 class. Amen. We will continue to do that too until we get to the entire uh, fivefold. If you don't have uh, the book on the uh, on the fivefold, please let me know. Hallelujah. Uh, we know we have a free one at the office of the apostle. We know we have the one for the for the prophet and the one for the teaching. It's not yet published, but we'll get you information that you need. I pray the Lord will bless you today. The Lord will strengthen you. Do anybody have any question in the audience? If you have any question, you can ask. If not, I'm trusting God that I will meet you next time. I will meet you next Saturday. And I'm trusting God that that will be able to help you. Hallelujah. May the Lord bless you. May the Lord strengthen you. May his grace never depart from you. And may he give you peace. Amen and amen. Amen. Amen.